You can call them gizmos. The Popeil Pocket Fisherman that makes a great thing. You can call them doohickeys. Perfectly simple operation. Just don't call them useless. Now, gadgets on modern models. gadget. Just the sound of the word makes you want to pick it up and try it out. Hey, good looking. We'll be back to pick you up later. Gadgets have spawned entire industries and even helped make the infomercial a television staple. Do I make product that's good? Wow. Now, I don't suggest you do that at home. Webster's defines gadget as an often small mechanical or electronic device with a practical use, but often thought of as a novelty. The gadgeteers who invent such devices like the self-propelled inner tube dream of unique ways to make life, if not easier, a little more interesting. They also take the extra step of bringing their vision to fruition. Once a year, 18 especially talented gadgeteers are called to one of the world's oldest retailers of gadgets, the Hamaker Schlemmer store in Manhattan. Hamaker Schlemmer is 151 years old. Uh, we opened our first store down in the Bowery section of New York in 1848. Uh, that was, for those of you who don't remember, that was when Zachary Taylor was elected president. It's here that the final judging of the year-long Search for Invention contest occurs. The 18 finalists were selected from more than 350 entries. To be eligible, contestants must have a patent and a working prototype of their invention. It's our way of saying thank you to all of the inventors who work against very difficult odds to bring their ideas to the marketplace. The finalists from all across the nation are not necessarily engineers or MIT graduates. Donald Martell is a school bus driver. His invention, the airtight container, was born from a desire to preserve a baseball autographed by Mickey Mantle. Everybody thought I was nuts, and I just started drawing it. And somebody said, I know an engineer could do a better thing on your drawings. And they sent me there. And the engineer said, I love this. I got a guy who does models. And they sent me there. The model maker says, you know, I got a guy who might even be able to produce it. They sent me there. And it, it's taken six years, but nothing's ever gone wrong. Martel's gadget utilizes a pump to vacuum seal containers designed to preserve collectibles ranging from hockey pucks and baseballs to jewelry stamps and coins. Now it's basically vacuum sealed. You can't separate it from the container, from the base. So what we do is we just have a little button, we're taking the base off, and now you have a vacuum sealed item. Thomas Kehoe invented a gadget to solve a dilemma in his life as well. He is a lifelong stutterer. I went through seven stuttering therapy programs over 15 years, and really nothing helped me uh, improve my, my speech. Um, so I had to find a way to, to talk fluently. Several years earlier... My fastest speech was 10 times slower than a non-stutterer. Kehoe invented an earphone device allowing stutterers to hear themselves on a slight delay. When attempting to keep pace with his voice, he stopped stuttering. I'm normal sounding speech and you talk as fast as you want. Am I talking pretty fast now? I'm talking pretty fast. Now he has invented a similar gadget that allows a stutterer or a shy person to speak in public. Along with the delay, the playback actually alters the tone of the voice prompting the speaker to exude confidence or enthusiasm. I'm going to program it for confident authority, which makes you slow down, sound more confident. The other mental state 
is happy enthusiasm. You put this on and you talk a little faster and you sound more enthusiastic and when you tell jokes, your jokes sound really funny, to you at least. Within this hour, we'll meet many of the other finalists and find out who will walk away with the grand prize. While some of these contestants may have spent years developing their inventions, the history of gadgets spans thousands of years. The word itself, though, is considerably younger. It didn't enter the English lexicon until the presentation of a gift that, while decidedly not a gadget, did require some assembly. Packed in more than 200 crates, the Statue of Liberty arrived in New York in 1885. This gift from France was fabricated by the Parisian firm of Gaget Gautier AC. It was Monsieur Gaget who came up with the idea of selling small replicas of Lady Liberty to excited New Yorkers who called the souvenirs not Gagets, but gadgets. While only a 19th century word, husband and wife authors Michael and Mary Woods have written a series of books on the origins of technology and found that gadgets permeated ancient civilizations. The Chinese magic spoon, a fascinating gadget that dates to 2600 BC. If you take an ordinary spoon and throw it on the ground onto a hard surface, the spoon is going to bounce and shake and finally come to rest. The magic spoon acted as if it was haunted. When a magic spoon hit the ground, the bowl always aligned itself in one direction while the handle pointed in another, and it was always north. Magic spoons were made out of magnetite, a natural magnetic material. People used it as a gadget, a toy, and an amusement for hundreds of years, and then someone realized, gee whiz, the bowl points one direction, the handle always points in the other direction, maybe this can help me find the way. By the 13th century, the Chinese would share the magic spoon with the rest of the world as the compass. Perhaps the ancient world's greatest gadgeteer was a Greek physicist who lived in the first century AD, Hero of Alexandria. Hero really was the Rube Goldberg of antiquity. He left us drawings of about a hundred different gadgets and gizmos and mechanical devices. Many of Hero's inventions were used not only during his lifetime, but ours. One example was called the sacrificial vessel, which flows only when money is introduced. Today it's no longer thought of as a gadget, but the vending machine drink dispenser. Hero's greatest gadget may have been little more than a source of amusement. He called it the air ball. A hollow metal ball pierced by two hollow tubes was suspended over a small cauldron. When heated, the ball would rapidly spin, delighting his friends in the days before television. A modern engineer recreated the air ball a few years ago and he clocked it and found that it spawned at 1500 revolutions per minute. It was the fastest rotating object in the ancient world. That air ball was the world's first steam engine, which in the 1800s fostered the Industrial Revolution, was used in locomotives and steamboats. While the physics behind Hero's air ball would later revolutionize technology, the 1800 years in between would see the introduction of countless gadgets. Many of those, like these fancy 19th century sheep shears, can be found inside this seven-story castle. The Mercer Museum in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, is home to thousands of gadgets dating from the Middle Ages through the early 20th century. It is a virtual shrine to all those gadgeteers who sought to build a better mousetrap. And in the mid-1800s, someone did. Once the mouse was inside the cage, the mouse could be kept as a family pet and uh, exercised on a regular basis by simply passing through the hole, the doorway here, into the exercise wheel where the mouse could run his little legs off. A far less humane gadget was the terrapin scoop. This is an example of a gadget that got to be too much of a good thing. In the middle of the 19th century, freshwater terrapin, or turtles, were quite a delicacy. 
This was a device that was made by Andrew Rickert of Doylestown for hunting terrapin. He reworked one of his farm tools. This, the end of this is made out of manure fork with the tines brought together at the top to form a scoop. When terrapin hunting, Rickert would poke about in the muck or the mud in the bottom of a river with the pointed end to locate the terrapin and then scoop it out with the other end. Like the terrapin scoop, the demand for this gadget has diminished over the past few hundred years as well. Today, we don't need to make our own pegs, but in the days before Walmart, when you made everything from your own rakes to clothing hooks, you couldn't have enough pegs. The moving part is the human, uh, the human arm uh, with this. The peg maker consists of a sharpened cylinder embedded in a piece of wood. As I put a new billet of wood up here to the top of the peg maker and pound it in, what that will do is push out the previous peg that I've made. Many of the gadgets that have survived to modern times are often found in the kitchen. And some, like the apple peeler, were made in a huge variety of styles. The Mercer has more than 60 different apple peelers in its collection, including one used for demonstrations. You place the apple on the prongs here. Set the blade in so that it's starting to cut the skin. and then guide the blade manually as you're turning the apple. The apple peeler, like thousands of other objects in the Mercer collection, were fashioned by hand from an enterprising gadgeteer with a need to meet. These gadgets were sometimes one-of-a-kind objects used solely by the maker. But five years prior to the Civil War, a pair of German immigrants would lay the foundation for how unique gadgets of the future would be marketed to a massive gadget-craving public. In 1858, Walter Hunt created a gadget in under three hours, then sold the patent for about $300 to repay debts. Since then, the modern safety pin has made countless millions. Gadgets will return on Modern Marvel. We now return to Gadgets on Modern Marvels. Back at the Hamaker Schlemmer Search for Invention contest, gadgeteers compete for not only a $5,000 grand prize, but for an even bigger dream, the possibility that this venerable retailer of gadgets will include their invention here on the shelves of their Manhattan store. It was in this building that Hamaker Slimmer introduced the first pop-up toaster, the first electric shaver, the steam iron, and the first cordless electric toothbrush, uh, just to name a few of the inventions. Hoping to add his name and his invention to this pedigree is John Picone, a quality assurance representative for the U.S. Department of Defense. Picone took a common everyday hand tool, the wrench, and turned it into a gadget. This is the powered adjustable wrench. You have a switch here which actuates the drawer to open and close. Picone had grown tired of trying to manually adjust wrenches in tight cramped quarters when the idea for the power wrench came to him. It's powered by two AA batteries and Picone envisions a day when astronauts, hampered by their bulky gloves, will use his wrench in space. Some gadgets just have a way of begging the question, why didn't anybody think of this sooner? There's no guarantee that any of the contest entrants will have their invention marketed by Homaker. For the decision to carry a particular gadget, such as the Cybot, a computerized robot that can deliver coffee or sing the national anthem, is up to company president Bill Booth and CEO Richard Tinberg. Well, I still think it's a great watch. You know, Hamaker Schlemmer is a company that is dedicated to finding the products that are the best in their category and those that are truly unique. And we specialize primarily in functional products, and some would say functional gadgetry. Hamaker Schlemmer evolved into gadgetry from this hardware store opened in the Bowery section of New York in 1848. That was 13 years prior to the outbreak of the Civil War. 
William Schlemmer was only a 12-year-old, newly arrived German immigrant when he began working here. His uncle, William Tolner, owned the store. By 1867, Schlemmer was part owner along with fellow German immigrant Alfred Hamaker. In 1881, Hamaker Schlemmer expanded their marketing efforts by introducing their first mail order catalog. Today it is the longest continually published catalog in the United States. At the turn of the century, the catalog began to reflect the propensity for unique items that would later distinguish the store. It advertised the first tool set for the newest technological wonder, the horseless carriage. The motorist touring kit was sold when there were only 600 automobiles in all of New York City. In 1926, Hamaker Schlemmer moved to its current location on 57th Street in Manhattan. The move brought a change in both clientele and product. Given the boom and building that was happening in the latter 20s uh, and the way that people wanted to furnish their homes, it was only natural that we would expand and add a wider variety of products to serve that clientele. When Hamaker shifted their focus from hardware to new luxury gadgets, they became the first to introduce dozens of what are today considered common household products. In 1937, one such product would immortalize the name of a popular band leader. Fred Waring was a Hamaker customer for a long time. He was also uh, the famous band leader of Fred Waring and the Pennsylvanians. And his wife had had dental surgery and had uh, difficulty eating her food. In response, Waring invented a device to blend his wife's food, making it softer and easier for her to eat. Hamaker began marketing the Waring Blender in 1937. It would be one of the top-selling blenders for decades to come. Over the years, other gadgets first introduced by Hamaker Schlemmer would serve as a history book of American pop culture. They range from the first bathroom scale in 1937 to the first electric pencil sharpener in 1947 and the portable blow dryer in 1953. The 1960s brought the first cordless phone. It was just like any other rotary phone of the time, except an antenna replaced the cord. The first pocket calculator, priced at a whopping $300, was introduced in 1972. A year later, the first automatic coffee maker, Mr. Coffee, made its debut. Today, a variety of robotic gadgets can be found at Hamaker, including the Robomo. This self-propelled computerized lawnmower can be programmed to learn the parameters of a backyard and even do the trimming. So where do all these ideas and gadgets come from? They're searched down and sorted out by Hamaker Schlemmer buyers like Mark Sheldon. While searching for an entirely different product, Sheldon stumbled upon an internet site for this device, the Zybernaut. The Zybernaut is a wearable computer, recently launched by Hamaker. This computer is uh, just like a desktop or a laptop, but it's completely wireless, completely wearable. Uh, you wear your CPU, which is under two pounds. You wear a headgear, which is just over a pound. The whole thing together is just under four pounds. It's faster than, than most desktops, um, at least my desktop. The Zybernaut's monitor is positioned about two inches from the user's eye, yet it projects the illusion of a 15-inch screen. It even comes with a portable camera capable of transmitting its data to other computers. And the Zybernaut can be programmed to respond to voice commands. Talking to gadgets or hearing from gadgets is especially popular at Hamaker. This pen is not really a pen. It's a digital voice recorder. Remember to program talking light switch. Remember to program talking light switch. It comes in handy for remembering to program other gadgets, like the talking light switch plate. Remember to bring digital recording pen to work today. Remember to bring digital recording pen to work today. 
while other gadgets like the laser beam golf putter that offers a direct line of sight to the hole, or even the beeping wallet that sets off an alarm whenever you remove a credit card, define Hamaker. The real attention getters are those larger than life items that possess a gadget sensibility. This is my idea of the ultimate gadget. What else would you call a tricycle built for seven other than a gadget of social transportation? This one just sold for $16,000 at Hamaker's Chicago store. It was purchased by this pizza chain owner from San Antonio, Texas as a birthday gift for his wife. The viability of any gadget from the septuplet tricycle to this fail-proof corkscrew is subject to countless social, economic, and intellectual factors. Some will withstand the test of time. Others will go down in history as just being downright wacky. In 1914, Tsar Nicholas II purchased one of every item in the Hamaker Schlemmer catalog for that year. Gadgets will return on modern marvels. Gadgets often result from the inventor's hobby or career. For John Lawrence of Campbellsville, Pennsylvania, it was a combination of his vocation, dentistry, and his avocation, vintage automobile restoration that propelled him to the search for invention contest finals. It's the dentist cleans your, your teeth. This device cleans the, the material and the gunk away from the undercarriage of your car. Lawrence's portable automobile undercarriage washer turns an otherwise strenuous job into one no more difficult than watering the lawn. It works by connecting a common garden hose gun nozzle to the undercarriage rod. The water mixes with a cleaning solution stored in a pressurized chamber. A squeeze of the nozzle shoots a powerful fan-shaped spray beneath the car. When Craig Freeman, a firefighter from Southern California, and his wife Pamela conceived of their gadget, they were less concerned with gunk than they were with junk. Junk food. What it is exactly is a countertop refrigerator that replaces the cookie jar. It's for vegetables and fruits. It's the convenience of having a healthy snack as opposed to having a sugar snack. Plugged into a 110 outlet, the veggie jar maintains refrigerator temperatures on the inside while remaining at room temperature on the outside. What the Freemans share with Dr. Lawrence, besides an interest in preventing tooth decay, is that they have both been through the United States patent process, which takes place in this Washington, D.C. building. The patents for the undercarriage washer and the countertop veggie jar are among the nearly seven million patents that have been filed since the system was established in 1790 under President George Washington. Navigating this maze of shelves and files is the job of inventors and patent attorneys who search out prior patents to determine if their idea is truly unique or not. Mike Kolitz is a longtime patent attorney who in decades of conducting patent searches has come across more than a few that have made him smile. He has compiled his favorites both in a book, Wacky Patents, and on his website, which offers a wacky patent of the month. The inventions that I research, they're not really wacky. It's just that through the passage of time, technologies which were of importance to people of days past may, in today's light, appear to us to be wacky. And then, then you take it a step further and say, say to yourself, if people today consider the technical experts of our grandparents to be wacky, what cherished ideas do we have that our, that our grandchildren are going to consider wacky? We may not survive long enough to know the answer. However, the fear of missing the future due to premature burial led to this wacky patent filed in 1891, the enunciator for the supposed dead. 
we just assume that there was a problem a hundred years ago of people being buried alive, supposedly dead, but actually alive. The Annunciator consisted of an above-ground bell attached to a cord inside a coffin. If the person inside awoke from what was only a misdiagnosed coma, they could alert cemetery visitors to their underground dilemma. While eyeglasses for chickens might appear wacky to some, they actually solve a real problem and were patented in 1903. It looks like it's a uh, glasses and a strap to hold the glasses on to a chicken to protect the chicken's eyes or give better vision. But if you read the text of the patent, you will find out that uh, apparently chickens being birds are in fact bird-brained, not the brightest creatures that God created. And at feeding time, uh, the chickens go around peck, 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 picking up the uh, particulate food to eat. And uh, very, very frequently, I'm told, and we learn from the patent, a chicken would uh, pluck out the eyes of another chicken. Though wacky in appearance, chicken glasses were a useful gadget. Variations have been worn by some intellectually challenged chickens ever since. However, the usefulness of the patent number 586,025 has yet to be realized. The combined grocer's package, uh, cheese slicer and grater, and uh, fly trap and mouse trap. This combination gadget invented in 1897 is what it claims to be a cheese grater and slicer that also kills vermin. If the patent office had the same knowledge of food sanitation it has today, such a patent would probably not have been issued. However, the preparation and eating of food has consistently been the inspiration for unique gadgets. In the 1920s, newsreels frequently reported on the works of a now forgotten inventor, Russell Oakes, also known as Professor I. M. Nuts, from Waukesha, Wisconsin. His grapefruit mask prevented the eater from being squirted in the eye. However, his pièce de résistance was the automatic donut dunker. You bring the donut to your mouth and eat like that without dripping any coffee on the tablecloth. Unfortunately for Oakes, his passion for the donut dunker was not shared by the public. Like the vast majority of gadgets, it would not stand the test of time. This is a gadget that has stood the test. You can even pick your teeth and open your uh, beer with a Swiss Army knife. It does everything. The Victorinox Corporation has been producing the multifunction spring-loaded Swiss Army knife since 1891. It was invented by the company's founder, Carl Elsener, from the cutlery factory he operated out of this house in Ebach, Switzerland. And Elsener did, in fact, invent the knife for the Swiss Army. A couple years ago, I was buying a Swiss Army knife for one of my kids for Christmas, and suddenly when I'm at the cash register, I look at this thing and I realize the Swiss are neutral. What's a Swiss Army? So I actually went home and called the Swiss Embassy. And they told me, yes, they do have an army. It's for defensive purposes only. Today, the knife is still used by not only the Swiss Army, but as standard equipment for space shuttle crews. In the 1950s, it even played a role in the Cold War. One of my favorite stories about the Swiss Army knife is when Francis Gary Powers and the U-2 plane was shot down over Russia. And Russia, of course, then was our mortal enemy, and they trotted him out in front of the cameras. And one of the things they showed was a Swiss Army knife, and they labeled it CIA equipment. As practical as Carl Elsener's gadget has been over the years, another gadgeteer would become famous for being anything but practical. Hired in 1857, Civil War nurse and founder of the Red Cross, Clara Barton became one of the first women ever employed by the U.S. Patent Office. Gadgets will return on Modern Marvels. Moments away from the crowning of Hamaker Schlemmer's Search for Invention Grand Prize winner, 
judges circulate amongst the gadgeteers, finalizing their decisions. They're also getting a glimpse at the future of gadgetry. More of a high-tech lifestyle is what we're moving towards. People look to these gadgets to make their life simpler, but the minute we make our lives simpler, then we stretch ourselves further to fill in those gaps we've created. A case in point are the gadgets invented by this San Francisco physician and this team of inventors from San Diego. Lou Arnell, his dad Leon, and best friend Tom Sturgis pooled their talents to invent the executive door closer. Its uh, function is to uh, create uh, privacy at the touch of a button. The executive door closer brings the convenience of remote control to the cumbersome task of opening and closing doors. I'm an attorney, uh, therefore uh, I have one of these in my office and I use it all the time, uh, often need for confidentiality and privacy. The time and energy savings can then be dedicated to exercise. And Dr. Robert Seneco has just the gadget for that. The Audio Feedback Ab Trainer offers a musical reminder to suck in your gut. You take your personal listening device, which might be a Walkman or a CD player, you hang it on the belt, you plug this ordinary pair of headphones in through the sensor switch on the belt so that if you're walking around like this with your gut in the way you should tucking in your tummy the sound through the headphones is wonderful on the other hand if you forget and we all forget sometimes and let your stomach pouch out so that you're not strengthening and toning those muscles you do this where's the sound you can still hear it but it doesn't sound good it sounds thin it sounds tinny such gadgets are prime examples of how at the dawn of the new millennium, we have come to call on technology to assist us in doing just about anything. But a hundred years ago, a true hero amongst gadgeteers was already envisioning such a world. His name was Rube Goldberg. He was the only living person to ever have his name in a dictionary as an adjective. The definition is when you overcomplicate a simple act. A Rube Goldberg is anything that is too complicated to be true. Except it works. <laughs> Reuben Lucius Goldberg was born in Northern California in 1883 to a father who insisted he become an engineer. After college, Goldberg complied. But six months later, he quit to pursue his dream of becoming an artist. He supported himself as a sports cartoonist for a San Francisco newspaper before moving to New York at age 23 in 1906. At that time, Americans were imagining the unlimited possibilities of machines. I think the whole idea of the machine age and everything else sort of caught up with him and he sort of felt that people were getting too dependent on gadgets and whereas he himself loved gadgets he had cars he loved photography things like that in new york goldberg became a prolific cartoonist drawing dozens of different comic strips he soon became the highest paid cartoonist in the nation his most popular cartoons involved his alter ego professor butts an inventor of outrageous gadgets. He thought that everybody was really sort of getting overcomplicated in terms of their lives, in terms of the things that they were buying and using. So his inventions were doing things the hard way. He was overcomplicating a simple act. And it wasn't meant with, it was meant as a humorist, and it was meant as satire, but it wasn't meant as an aggressive put down of the machine age. Goldberg's Professor Butts cartoons were so popular in the first half of the century that in 1995 the US Postal Service honored him with a postage stamp. The image is one of his best known gadgets, the self-operating napkin. The irony of Goldberg is that while he was an artist, a sculptor, wrote magazine articles, and even several popular songs, he never actually made one of his gadgets. 
However, he used his engineering background to assure that if somebody followed his plans, and in some cases, if the porcupine performed accordingly, the gadget would work. Once a year, Goldberg's imaginative engineering and dedication to gadgetry is celebrated at Purdue University in Indiana. It is there that the Theta Tau Engineering Fraternity sponsors a Rube Goldberg contest. The goal is to create a device to perform the simplest of acts, such as applying toothpaste to a toothbrush, in no fewer than 20 steps. While few, if any, of these Goldberg devices will find their way to the marketplace, they're marvels that celebrate gadgetry. And that's all Goldberg ever wanted to do. Rube didn't invent gadgets, but he celebrated gadgets. He celebrated them in a, in a wonderful way because he pointed out to you that gadgets were great as long as you didn't let them overcomplicate your life too much or dominate your life too much. And I think for that point of view, definitely, he was a missionary of gadgets and a celebrant. Goldberg's inventiveness has made his name immortal. Today it describes not only elaborate gadgets, but everything from the U.S. tax code to bureaucratic plans for building highways. Goldberg died in 1970 at age 77. And when he did, if you know someone that can't chew too well, the gadget king of the second half of the century had already inherited the throne. In 1939, Rube Goldberg reinvented himself as a serious political cartoonist for the New York Sun and was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 1947. Modern Marvels will return. With the grand prize winner of the Hamaker Schlemmer Search for Invention contest about to be announced, the contestants nervously await the decision. Will they give a nod to one of the many high-tech gadgets in the contest, or reward a more utilitarian gadget? Edwin Rodriguez hopes so. Rodriguez is a chef in a New York restaurant where the often difficult to peel plantain is a staple of the menu. We, we do all kinds of things with them. So you can fry them, bake them, boil them, mash them. So it's, it's very nice. Rodriguez made his job much easier when he invented and patented a completely unique and effective plantain peeler. As a butcher in a New Jersey grocery store, James Mick was also in a unique position to spot and solve a problem. His shopping cart canopy keeps groceries dry as they're pushed to the car on rainy days. A one, two, three operation. Whoever wins, there is a good chance that they might have to spend the prize money on the daunting task of bringing their invention to the marketplace. All you'll spend for this fabulous machine is just four easy payments of $39.95. That's all. And there may not be a better person on the planet to learn how to do that from than Ron Popeil. Popeil is an inventor with a natural gift for explaining the benefits of his creations. He has probably logged as much time on television as anyone and made the names Popeil and Ronco hallmarks of television advertising. I happen to hit on an area of consumer products which really aren't uh, phenomenal marvels per se. It's not like inventing electricity or the zipper or getting involved in computer uh, inventions. I create stuff that's needed around the house and, and I enjoy it. Popeil recalls little from his childhood except a sense of scarcity. He didn't meet his father, an inventor himself, until he was 16 years old. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to show you the greatest kitchen appliance ever made. It's called At age 20, Ron Popeil made his first television commercial. He was marketing one of his father's inventions. And of course he went on with Vegematic, Chopomatic, Dialomatic, and Mincematic. Now folks, I'll show you the crowning feature of this marvelous new machine. For now you can chop three or four whole onions at one time. 
completely unscripted for Peel's gift for Gab held the audience's attention and convinced them that the chop matic or anything else he had to sell was well worth owning. We'll play some shows. In the 1960s, Popeil began marketing his own inventions. The decades to follow would see a steady stream of commercials for new Popeil gadgets, many of which simply met his own needs. Take the pocket fisherman. A fisherman, and I am one, I'll pass a body of water and I'll be driving by and I'll say, you know what? That body of water over there looks like it's loaded with fish. If I only had a fishing rod, well, Easy for me, I just go in my glove compartment, take out the pocket fisherman, give a couple casts to see if I'm right. Well, you set the dial on your FM radio and testing, testing, testing. Hey, I'm on the radio. Hey, I'm on when Popeil introduced Mr. Microphone, a gadget for entertaining in the mid-70s, he proved his natural instincts for understanding the consumer market. Living in this gift-giving society that we do, we're problemed with buying presents, Christmas time especially for the kids. What greater gift could you give a kid if you gave him a Mr. Microphone? Something that would help him sing, give him self-confidence, and he could clown around it. You could have parties with it. The darn thing sold for under $20, and it was a great electronic product. And so let's meet my father, Ron Popeil. Dad, come out here. In 1989, the FCC loosened time restrictions on commercials. And soon, the modern infomercial was born. Ron Popeil was riding the wave with his food dehydrator. And later, his Showtime rotisserie, which Popeil claims will surpass $1 billion in sales. Many of Popeil's infomercials are taped in his own home, which is stocked with his inventions. Among them is the Inside the Egg Scrambler. A small motorized pin scrambles eggs inside their shell, resulting in a creamy texture rather than a slimy one. And when Popeil whips up an omelet, he uses another of his inventions the handled spatula. On his way out the door, Popeil also uses one of his most talked about inventions, GLH, or Great Looking Hair, Formula 9. The aerosol spray, which comes in one of 23 shades of hair color, was created to cover bald spots, and at least on Popeil, it works. I love what I do. It's no different than a baseball player playing baseball. He would play for nothing because he enjoys the game. I enjoy the game of inventing and marketing those products that I invent. And I, I love it. It's, it's enjoyment to me. How much are they and where can you get them? You all want to know, right? Right. I was looking at some... While Ron Popeil has earned millions off his inventions, the $5,000 grand prize in the Search for Invention contest might offer one of these gadgeteers a stepping stone to an equally prosperous future. And it's time for the grand prize winner. The grand prize winner receives a check from Hanukkah Summer for $5,000, and that grand prize winner today goes to... The electric powered adjustable wrench, John P. Cohn. Congratulations. This is a wonderful device. Wonderful device. Thank you so much, John. Congratulations. Only time will tell if Picone's adjustable powered wrench will someday make his name as synonymous with inventiveness as Rube Goldberg's bring him the riches enjoyed by Ron Popeil, or be lost in time like I Am Nuts, automatic donut dunker. But as long as the gadgeteers of the world continue dreaming, planning, and building, the future holds promise for being just a bit more colorful and a lot more fun. 
The History Channel proudly offers the program you're watching on home video for only $24.95 plus shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-708-1776 or shop online at historychannel.com. If you're having a problem dunking donuts, getting lonely while riding a bicycle, or if you just happen to need a pack of robot dogs, the History Channel has the gadgets for you. From the high-tech toys of James Bond to the weirdest inventions of all time, check out all of them on Tech It to the Max Week on Modern Marvels, tomorrow on the History Channel. Gadget. Just the sound of the word makes you want to pick it up and try it out. Hey, good looking! We'll be back to pick you up later! Gadgets have spawned entire industries and even helped make the infomercial a television staple. Do I make product that's good? Wow. Now, I don't suggest you do that at home. Webster's defines gadget as an often small mechanical or electronic device with a practical use, but often thought of as a novelty. The gadgeteers who invent such devices like the self-propelled inner tube dream of unique ways to make life, if not easier, a little more interesting. They also take the extra step of bringing their vision to fruition. Once a year, 18 especially You can call them gizmos. The Popeil Pocket Fisherman that makes a great thing. You can call them doohickeys. Perfectly simple operation. Just don't call them useless. Now, gadgets on Modern Marvel. Talented gadgeteers are called to one of the world's oldest retailers of gadgets, the Hamaker Schlemmer store in Manhattan. Hamaker Schlemmer is 151 years old. Uh, we opened our first store down in the Bowery section of New York in 1848. Uh, that was, for those of you who don't remember, that was when Zachary Taylor was elected president. It's here that the final judging of the year-long Search for Invention contest occurs. The 18 finalists were selected from more than 350 entries. To be eligible, contestants must have a patent and a working prototype of their invention. It's our way of saying thank you to all of the inventors who work against very difficult odds to bring their ideas to the marketplace. The finalists from all across... ...little button, you're taking the base off, and now you have a vacuum sealed item. Thomas Kehoe invented a gadget to solve a dilemma in his life as well. He is a lifelong stutterer. I went through seven stuttering therapy programs over 15 years, and really nothing helped me uh, improve my, my speech. Um, so I had to find a way to, to talk fluently. Several years earlier... My fastest speech was ten times slower than a non that stutterer. Kehoe invented an earphone device allowing stutterers to hear themselves on a slight delay. When attempting to keep pace with his voice, he stopped stuttering. Normal sounding speech and you talk as fast as you want. Am I talking pretty fast now? I'm talking pretty fast. Now, across the nation are not necessarily engineers or MIT graduates. Donald Martell is a school bus driver. His invention, the airtight container, was born from a desire to preserve a baseball autographed by Mickey Mantle. Everybody thought I was nuts and I just started drawing it and somebody said, I know an engineer could do a better thing on your drawings and they sent me there and the engineer said, I love this, I got a guy who does models and they sent me there. The model maker says, you know, I got a guy who might even be able to produce it, they sent me there and it, it's taken six years but nothing's ever gone wrong. 
Martel's gadget utilizes a pump to vacuum seal containers designed to preserve collectibles ranging from hockey pucks and baseballs to jewelry stamps and coins. Now it's basically vacuum sealed. You can't separate it from the container, from the base. So what we do is we just have a little